Okay. Okay. Should, we, not even, should I do it? Should I start? Okay. Hi, everyone. So, if of course you can't hear too. Um, so, welcome, and it's so lovely to see you all here, and also welcome to the folks joining us online. Um, so, this is the first big event as part of our Rehearsing Freedoms Festival at Healing Justice London. Um, and I just want to, uh, I suppose, remind us all that we are in rehearsal right now, okay? We are a really small team. We fundraised uh, really hard to be able to host and hold this festival um, with some amazing collaborators and community partners, okay? So we ask for spaciousness as we practice together in this session today. So, Rehearsing Freedoms is a month-long pan-London festival. Hopefully, some of you will be going to some of our various events. Um, and it's a festival of community health, healing, movement building, arts and culture. And we are organising it from Healing Justice London, which builds community-led health and healing to create capacity, for personal and structural transformation. Okay. So I'm China Mills and I work for Healing Justice London and lead the Deaths by Welfare projects and also work as a researcher at HJL. Okay. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of housekeeping and then I'm gonna give a bit of a framing for the session um, and then I'm going to introduce our brilliant speaker. So you might get a bit bored of hearing from me at the beginning, but then I'm going to be really quiet for the rest of it, okay? So just in terms of housekeeping, I've had to write this down because I make these things sound so much more confusing if I do it off script. So if you want to go to the toilets, they're on the ground floor of the building near the reception desk. So to access them from here, you can either take two flights of stairs or the lift, which, on the left of, which is on the left of the sign-in desk where you received your masks. You go through the red double doors and the toilet is on the right next to the reception desk. And there's someone in there who can beep you in and out and, and guide you if you get halfway there and then get lost. Uh, we aren't expecting any fire alarm tests, so if one does happen, then we'll need to evacuate the building. Um, so from this gallery room, your closest fire exit is to the bottom left of this room, through the corridor, just near the oasis space, that curtained area at the back. We follow the stairs and head through the fire escape door. Exit the building area and then follow the road round right onto Brixton Road. Okay, and there are evacuation swings available to use if needed. Um, yeah, okay. If you happen to be in the front of the gallery when you when the fire alarm goes off, your closest exit is upstairs to the left, just to the left of where the sign-in desk is, where you got your masks from. And again, you'll be on Brixton Road. We have a hearing induction loop fitted within the carpeted area. So this gray carpet on the floor here. So for those who need this, please feel free to find a space within the carpet area and adjust accordingly. And finally, we have BSL interpretation tonight from Angie and Paul. Um, and we've got some chairs reserved just here on the left of the first few rows for any folks who need to access um, our interpreters. Okay, so I just next want to quickly remind us of our community principles which guide our work at Healing Justice London, which can be helpful in this space and which come from years of practice from Healing Justice, from our director and co-founder Fazana Khan and from Voices That Shake. And some of those are pinned up around the room. We have quite a few of them, but I've just chosen a few that I think might be useful in this space tonight. 
And the first one is to remind us about accessibility so that we can practice together seeking clarity as part of how we are curious with each other and about our work. The other I thought was useful to think through is around power and privilege. So perhaps if you're in a dominant identity, please consider how you're making space for others. And if you're in a more marginalized identity, maybe practice con uh, consider practicing taking up a bit more space in this event tonight. And always to practice compassion. We often say we are hard on ideas and soft on people. And I think particularly today and what we're talking about this evening, it's just important to think about lived experience and think about trauma as part of that. And that these aren't just conversations, they're very lived and tangible, very material, and they probably impact on us on lots of different levels. So just try to listen, I suppose, to what your body needs, feel free to opt in, opt out, and take time to hydrate and rest. And we have an area there where you can literally go and lie down, if that's what you would like to do. Um, or there's other rooms within the gallery that you might want to, to go to if you need to access them. So <clears throat> to give a bit, just before I kind of give a bit more of an intro um, to our speakers, I suppose when I was thinking about chairing this session, I was thinking about one of our organizing questions for Rehearsing Freedoms is what capacities, skills, and strategies do we need to practice to help us get free together? And when I think about practice, I think about Audre Lorde, who gave a speech at a graduation ceremony in 1989, where she said that every day of our lives is practice in becoming the person you want to be. And straight after this, she named something that feels really important for me to name right now in this room, given what's happening in the world at the moment. She says, every day that we sit back silent, refusing to use our power, terrible things are being done in our names. And one of the terrible things that she named in 1989 is the US support of Israel's violent oppression of the people of Palestine. And I just feel like we can't talk or have a panel on state violence without talking about the current genocide of Palestinians and the ongoing occupation and settler colonization of Palestine by Israel with international support from the UK and the US and, and many other countries. And I'm also really reminded here of the words and actions of disability justice collectives such as Sins Invalid, the Autistic People of Colour Collective, and the Abolition and Disability Justice Collective, that disability justice can't exist under settler colonialism, military occupation, imprisonment, or an apartheid. So there's no disability justice under military occupation, and Palestine must be free. And so we at Healing Justice have been dreaming about this gathering with these speakers for a really long time. And we always knew that we needed these exact speakers. To me, this is total royalty, and I'm having to take deep breaths to keep my fangirl in check, but I know that you all hate that, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it in check. So I've been leading um, the Deaths by Welfare Project at Healing Justice for quite a few, for a few years. Um, we look at and investigate how the welfare system particularly disables and kills people in the UK, but also of disabled people's resistance and defiance to these life-threatening policies. And we try to celebrate um, and uplift some of that defiance and resistance in this exhibition that surrounds us now and that you're welcome to take a look at. Um, so for some folks, this experience of welfare state violence started in 2008 under the kind of guise of austerity. But for others, and particularly for many racialized folks, that violence was already really well known and was, it was known to be designed into the welfare system. Okay. And so people's deaths linked to the welfare system aren't always thought about as being deaths due to state violence. 
Um, but we've been finding it really helpful to, to locate them in that way. Um, and particularly, I think worth naming, is that ideas of undeservingness and dependency represent a really key tactic in a persistent history of state-sanctioned assaults on poor people more generally, but especially racialized and disabled people and folks who are seeking asylum. And that narrative of dependency is part of the violent design of the welfare state and has vitally shaped the ongoing divestment um, through gaslighting, especially of black women, um, around welfare and other forms of state violence. And that's something that Stella Dadzi, Beverly Bryan, um, and Suzanne Scaife write about in 1985 in their book, Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain. And that, for me, the prophecy of your book, Stella, is so apparent, and especially when reading it alongside Deruka's work, um, an oral history project, which is called A Heavy Non-Presence, which was an oral history with black Londoners about their accounts of the British welfare state written in 2021. And it was also around 2021 that I first heard Tumu Johnson speak at a Sisters Uncut protest, protesting against routine and systemic violence against women in the police for, from the police force, where she named the Department for Work and Pensions, the DWP, as one arm of state violence. And I was like, I just need to learn more from this person. And then finally, I got to meet you over the summer. And I should say that we were supposed to have a fourth panelist with us, Gargi Bacharaya, who unfortunately is too ill to join us, but who I am grateful to for not coming when she was feeling ill and for practicing the kind of self-care that we should we that we would hope we can all practice, right, if we're rehearsing freedoms. And so this is why bringing you all together in this space is really meaningful to me personally and I think for all of our movements. And it feels especially important to have this conversation as part of Rehearsing Freedoms, where we can do critique, but maybe we want to do it as part of something else. So sharing and learning together about how all of us, including everyone in the room, are already practicing life-affirming systems and ways of being. So finally, I'm just going to introduce each speaker with a little bit more info. And then we can start properly. I should say I wanted them to introduce themselves, and everybody was too modest. So I was like, OK, I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> which I find astounding, but there you go. Um, so Tumu Johnson is currently co-director of the feminist Disabled Women's Collective Sisters of Frida and has been involved in feminist organizing around abolition and the continued struggle for disability justice. She currently works part-time in the NHS as a psychologist and also works for a community peer counseling project. Stella Dadzi, just here to my right, is a published writer and feminist historian, best known, as we mentioned, for your work, The Heart of the Race, Black Women's Lives in Britain, with Beverly Bryan and Suzanne Scaife. She's a founder member of the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent, which was a national umbrella group for black women that emerged in the late 70s as part of the British Civil Rights Movement and which campaigned around health and welfare issues as well as police brutality and immigration. And her latest book, A Kick in the Belly, Women, Slavery and Resistance, was published by Verso in October 2020. And among other things, it explores how black women used their reproductive agency to undermine the project of enslavement. And finally, Daruka Shields is a writer and editor from South London. She works across multiple disciplines with a particular focus on black diaspora aesthetics, cultures, and epistemologies. In 2021, she published A Heavy Non-Presence, which is a multi-generational oral history project that gathered seven black Londoners' accounts of their interactions with the UK welfare state. And the project was introduced by an essay analyzing the co-development of the modern welfare state with measures to expel or instrumentalize black peoples. Thank you. 
So in this session, we're going to start with a kind of general question, which each of our speakers are going are gonna to talk to. And then I asked each speaker if they would come up with a question they wanted me to ask them. So we'll do that next. We'll then have a 15 minute break and then there'll be time to have a discussion with all of you and our speakers, perhaps ending on just some final thoughts from the speakers. Okay. So maybe I can go into that general first question. So each of you and your work have shaped our thinking in lots of different ways. And I do know this is a mega question, so feel free to speak to whatever part of it interests you. But we would love to hear your thoughts and reflections on thinking about the welfare state as a form of state violence, what that might mean for resistance, and possibly for creating new or nurturing existing cross-movement solidarities. I'm looking at you too, Lou. <laughs> Okay, for sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I wrote something because I'm having a huge pain flare up. And so, lots of medications, so I'm a bit absent minded. Um, so, I wrote something. Um, so, I'm going to read. So, when thinking about what to say today, um, I felt overwhelmed. Um, I spent some time listening to the words of disabled comrades and reading news articles and still struggled to put pen to paper. Um, I saw the words, dead people don't claim, it's actually over there. Um, and it reminded me of being at a sister's uncut march and screaming, dead women can't vote. And it reminded me that all struggles are connected. Um, so fatigue and pain getting in the way, but also something different this time. Um, when I think about this subject, my response is visceral. Um, I struggle to find the words because my mind is telling me that I know this in my bones and that my life lived under the pervasive and insidious tangles of ableism is kind of what I'm tapping into. Um, there are ways in which the welfare state inflicts violence onto us that is obvious and undeniable. The UK were found to have systematically violated our human rights by a uh, UN special, I can never say this word, rapporteur, uh, in 2016. But disabled people aren't believed. So many people fought so hard to shine a light on the violence that happens continuously, the violence that is by design and is deadly. Other ways in which we are dehumanized, controlled and underserved are obvious to us maybe, but perhaps more hidden to others, say, non-disabled members of the public. So what underlies this? Well, many structures, a compl complicated web of structures, but ableism, ableism as an organizing structure of our, of our world. Um, my friend Molly and I were writing something about disability justice together, and I thought I'd use a statement or a question that we spent many hours discussing. Disabled people find themselves at a very specific juncture with capitalism where we are asked, are we of any use? And if not, we ask, can we live? We are asked to prove over and over if we are deserving of what we need, sorted into deserving and undeserving recipients. It might be that we need financial support because we can't work in the ways that capitalism tells us we must, or it could be a PIP application a deficit-based assessment that is interpreted as confirming whether or not we are in fact disabled enough. It is supposed to acknowledge and help with the thousands extra that it costs to be disabled in this world. And it's meant to be a tool that allows us access to other support. How devastating then, when after spilling out our most inner world, our biggest struggles, our information that is judged and stigmatized, how devastating to not be believed to be left rejected and destitute. In other words, to be told, no, you cannot live. The, the, the themes that I think about over and over are control and the construct of independence. Independence is a myth and a very useful one when trying to uphold ableism, but I hope to talk about this a bit more later on. 
we see a spectrum of control exerted by the welfare state. Appointments at the job centre with no leniency, dictating where you have to be and when. Social care provided in people's homes where they are given maybe four care visits a day. Restrictions on whether a carer is allowed to make you hot food. Rules on where we will be supported to go or not. Care schedules that dictate what time we go to bed and what time we can get up in the morning. Fear that if we are seen attending events or having fun, that will be reported and held against us. People who are not receiving adequate care become prisoners in their own homes. The same carcerality involved in placing disabled people into rigid care homes, but this time concealed under our own roofs. The fact that if you receive a care package in one borough, it is not portable. You cannot move house or leave without risking the life-sustaining care that you might be receiving. I invite you to think for a moment what the knock-on effects of this might be. Women experiencing domestic violence are trapped. There is no freedom to move or change or flee. We cannot move for love, for education, to live with the people we want to live with. Control. Control of disabled people is present in all areas of the welfare state. The mental health system, which has a carceral logic at its core and where oppression is institutionalized within its very walls, for example, where black, where black people are incarcerated in mental health hospitals at a disproportionately higher rate than white people, where cultural beliefs are pathologized and where the link between these institutions and other racist institutions, such as the police, is close-knit and intimate. How many times must we hear that a black person experiencing a crisis has been tasered by the police? Within these health systems, black workers continue to be an exploited workforce. Actually, it's something that, Stella, I think you wrote about in your book. Um, and it's still, it's still the case years later. Their hours and labor holding up the NHS, and yet they continue to experience poor pay, unfair working conditions, and racism inside and outside the workplace. In London, many secure psychiatric wards are staffed by black staff. They are, they are employed to carry out the most violent parts of the work. Sites of healthcare continue to be used as a tool to inflict violence. Only days ago, Rishi Sunak was calling for a ban on trans women on, trans, on women's wards. The connections between the different sites of violence are compounding in nature. There is a repetition, a pattern, a relentlessness present which is designed to wear people down. We must make connections and we must map and figure out the ecosystems of our movements, of our connections where our struggles meet and where they don't. Elucidating it all so that even if we don't experience it, we know about it and we're not gonna let it happen to anyone else. Wherever there is struggle, there is resistance. Everything we have won, we have won for ourselves. I think that's quite evident on the walls of this exhibition, actually. Resistance to me, in reference to the second part of the question, <laughs> um, looks like, can you put that a bit closer? I'm scared, can you hear me? Okay, cool. <laughs> Resistance to me looks like the demos and the banners and the lock-ons and the wheelchair blockades and the campaigns, the endless emails sent, meetings held, conversations had, thoughts shared, the sharing of knowledge from one disabled comrade to another. What I have learned, I have been taught with patience and generosity. It looks like the relationships that we build with each other, where we hold space for our own and each other's needs, where we relate in a different way and reject, reject the idea that we are burdensome. It's deep listening to what others are experiencing and connecting with them in joint struggle. It's disabled folk bringing me food when I'm sick and it's meeting lying down. Survival is also resistance. Sadly, not all folk have survived the violence of the welfare state and holding them in spirit is so important. As many have said before, one death is one death, one death is too many.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Really, like, yeah. <sighs> um, partly, I want to just sit <laughs> and absorb, um, but I will also come towards this question. Um, I guess one of the reasons that I found it important to join those who were naming welfare state violence as an extension of state violence um, was that I came back to the UK in 2017 um, and what I saw here among the people dear to me was really hard to see. The way that people were having to live, having to um, struggle really intensely to just meet their basic needs. Uh, the rate of evictions, um, people being unhoused, becoming unhoused really violently. The processes had, everything had become, uh, I guess, more widespread, right? Like, these were forms of suffering that I was familiar with but that were broader. And at the same time, we were in, um, uh, like, we were in this aftermath, well, we were in the uprising and the aftermath of the uprising. There was Black Lives Matter. And so there was this form of uh, spectacular violence that was very present on people's lips, in people's minds, but there wasn't, it seemed to me, so much language within that movement for these mundane forms of violence that had to do with how people try to just live in very, very um, basic ways. So a lot of people were using food banks um, and <coughs> there was this effort to, what I perceived of as an effort a national effort, a state effort, a kind of media effort to normalize that, um, to not acknowledge that something quite radical had happened. So not radical in the exciting movement way, but um, just something fundamental was shifting. There were new forms of, or old forms of precarity were more widespread, were more prevalent. Um, and I really wanted to, talk to people who were um, experiencing this about what they were dealing with, but also I felt like this effort to normalize what was happening was creating this kind of stultifying silence and this like really toxic internalization of a lot of the logics that were being normalized, right? So the idea that Basically, everything's your fault. This is a meritocracy, blah, blah, blah. We like we really know this language, I think. Um, and so one of the, I'm trying to come to the second part of the question. Um, one of the important steps to take was to figure out how to kind of listen to each other, um, to build a kind of tolerance for listening to each other's accounts of these systems and for coming away from the logic that you internalize when you are met with, when you are having like endless meetings at Universal Credit, right? Like it's actually, it doesn't take that long before you kind of believe your job coach a, you know, in that, you know, it's like you're not making enough money and no one else is to blame for that but you, right? There isn't an economy we're in, there isn't anything producing these conditions, it's just you navigating these conditions very poorly. Um, and so it was, I just wanted to talk to people, see where people were at and try to have enough conversations and make sure that there were like enough networks between the people I was talking to so that they could talk to each other beyond this kind of veil of shame. I was also reading a lot. Um, I was reading The Heart of the Race again. I was uh, reading Audrey Lord's letter to the Women of London um, where she talks about 
um, yeah, what kind of internalizing these logics can do to us and do to what, what it means that we can do to each other. So I think that with violence, it enters us and it exits us, and we're not always in control if we're unconscious about kind of where it's being directed. So I was also thinking about the ways that mundane violence is transformed into forms of spectacular violence and how maybe we needed to intercept that by figuring out that some forms of violence that haven't thus been named violent need to be named in that way. Um, maybe that's all I'll say to that question. I was going to answer that, but you know, I can't really add to what <laughs> you've both said. Um, it is absolutely the case mm -hmm. that our struggles are connected. It is absolutely the case that this predates 2010. And I was actually going to answer your question by reading a section from The Heart of the Race, but you've kind of summarised it so perfectly, I, I, I can't see the point. Um, one of the things we did, or tried to do, was to link what happens to us to the economic system in which we live, so we understand that it is about capitalism, it is about um, our usefulness or otherwise to the money-making machine, and um, it is also the case that um, we are most powerful, at our most powerful, when we come together to, to resist. But anyway, ask me the first question and I'll... I'll <laughs> Thank you all so much. So, so now we're going to move into, as I mentioned, um, I asked each speaker what question would they, would they like me to ask. Um, and after each of you have answered, there'll be space for anyone else to, to chime in if, if you want to. So Stella wanted to be asked the question, how have black women experienced state violence historically and how have they responded in the past? So let's, let's start, not quite the beginning, but let's go back away um, and acknowledge that there is no greater form of state violence than enslavement. Um, black women and men were subjected to torture, physical coercion, arbitrary execution, and in the case of women, um, state-sponsored gendered brutality throughout the period of enslavement. Um, but I always try to get underneath that tale of victimhood by reminding myself and others that naked as we were, we came armed with a treasure trove of inner resources and that included a strong sense of self and our role in this place, in this world. Um, a shared knowledge of the medicinal properties of plants and what's available to us in, that, in the natural world. And added to that, without idealizing it, because we could talk about the, the other side of the coin, but certainly if you think about some of the, the sheroes who we, we, we name, um, from pre-colonial Africa, then we see a strong sense of uncompromising commitment to resist enslavement and resist oppression. So what you see emerging, even hundreds of years ago, is resistance that took the forms of both subtle responses and very overt responses. And I think we're still drawing on that resource um, to this very day. Everything from marinage, which was an attempt to be self-determined, to, to live a life that we ourselves um, had control over. Um, setting fire to the plantations. I'm not going to advocate the modern version of that, but um, certainly we have some pretty fiery responses available to us now. Um, and, of course... 
um, efforts to escape, um, and a stubborn refusal to accept definitions of us. So I think when we think about black women and the legacy that we draw on, um, as I say, without romanticizing that, we, we, we already can begin to name some of the resources that we require nowadays, that are required nowadays, to begin to address some of the violence we're talking about. And I think I'd like to add um, that when it came to their own bodies, despite the limited agency that black women, enslaved black women, had access to, um, they still found ways to sabotage their owners' efforts to breed them, to turn them into just machines for making more money. And um, that include everything from using their own bodies, prolonged breastfeeding. Don't try this at home, but you know certainly there's a, there's a belief that if you breastfeed, um, then it will reduce your chance of reconceiving. And of course, we can even find parliamentary reports that talk about black women who use natural abortions to um, rid themselves of unwanted pregnancies. And that is backed up by data. You know, you can see in the demographic data. Um, you've got a copy of the um, kick in the belly, but if you're interested in that, it, it certainly um, it's worth looking at that book. So all of that was in the distant past. And you might think, so what's all that got to do with now? Um, but as I said, that's, that's really important for me as a starting point because we're talking about the legacy that we can draw on. And when black women came here, um, obviously we've been here for a long time, but when the large numbers of black women began to arrive in this country post-World War II, they arrived armed with the knowledge that they were survivors and um, with a determination to stay vigilant um, to the different ways that the state can keep them in their place. And they encountered, for example, the NHS, not as patients, but as, as workers, as, 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 as um, nurses and auxiliaries. And um, we've only got to look at the death toll from COVID to see the extent to which black women's health needs have rarely been considered and continue to not be prioritized. So I think that's, that's the kind of general context, begin, before we even begin to talk about specific disabilities, that you know, this discussion needs to be framed in. Now, um, you have to stop me, because I can go on and on and on about this. And I, I hate to be a talking head. I'd kind of prefer to have a discussion with people. But I think it is worth mentioning that um, you know, as China um, pointed out and as Temu pointed out, you know, the systems are linked and, you know, when we begin to widen our lens and think about our encounters with the immigration service or encounters with the police or with the schools or with social services, then you really begin to get a sense of what that violence looks like and feels like and its impact on people's personal lives but also their families and their communities. And I think we said in the heart of the race that you know, good health is not just about an absence of, of sickness or disease. It's actually about the homes you live in, the working conditions you have to face, the hours you have to work, whether you're doing shift work, all of those things that feed into an experience of, of either well-being or alienation. And um, neglect. So, uh, you know, we're not just talking about social deprivation, are we? We're talking about violence that is a very, very real lived experience for large numbers of people. And what alarms me, I think, you know, when The Heart of the Race was republished, everybody said, rah, 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 you know, 35 years on and it's still relevant. Well, that's a double-edged sword, isn't it? It's still relevant, that's great. And it's great that it's informing a new generation of, of young feminists, but it's also quite depressing to think that every word in this book 
is as relevant today as it ever was. It's quite shocking. You know, you, you take Thatcherism and all the stuff that went with that and look at now, and so little seems to have changed despite our activism. And I think that's something that we need to unpack, really, because it can feel very wearing. It can feel very two steps forward, one step back. Did I say that right? Two steps forward, one step back. You know, because like here we are battling again against the same old oppressions, and yet we're still confronted with it. And I suppose, um, yeah, I could say more, but I think I, I will finish this, this response by just saying that um, one of the things that motivates me, um, and I'm in my 70s now, so I have no intention of stopping this struggle until, you know, I'm carried out in a box. But one of the things that, that gives me hope and strength is the knowledge that we have been through worse. You know, if we think about enslavement, if we think about some of the atrocities that have occurred over time, you know, through apartheid, through all kinds of, of uh, historical events that I could name, the one thing that we do know is that we are still here, we're still standing, we're still organizing, we're still coming together, we're still finding ways within ourselves and our communities to fight back, to stand up and say no. And I really think that is possibly the starting point to the answer to your question, really. You know, how do we begin to resist? Well, we're not beginning, are we? We just keep on keeping on. We find new ways of winning. Thank you so much, Stella. And what that really, I really loved what you said about black women's refusal. You said something about black women's refusal to be defined by you know, other people's definitions or ideas or state-sanctioned definitions. And it really made me think, actually, Dorika, of the question that you asked to be asked, as it were. Um, and so it made me think about psychic violence, which is something that you, you, you wanted to be asked about, and how we resist internalizing the state's understanding of dependency as being failure. So could you, would you mind speaking to that now? You be, yeah, okay, I can do this mic. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so I think I spoke a little bit to this earlier, but um, I think one thing I was noticing, I was doing these, I was having these conversations with people or doing these interviews um, between 2018 and 2020. And one thing I noticed was that it was great to be able to talk to people over a period of time. Um, and there are lots of ups and downs in that process, um, in the process of having to make a new claim or having to repeat a claim. Um, and of course, with that comes ebbs and flows in one's like uh, psychological, like spiritual experience of this process, of these processes. Um, and gradually, I started to ask people uh, what they were what they were doing in their days that made them feel differently than they usually felt. So I was trying not to do like a um, like a toxic positivity thing and be like, "What makes you feel good?" You know, but to be like, "What what are the moments where something about this like ongoing tension shifts?" Um, I feel like to me you had this beautiful section of what you read that was kind of about these moments that interrupt. Um, and one person who was describing like uh, her pseudonym, so these were anonymized um, accounts and her pseudonym is Tamara. And Tamara talked about putting her kid to bed, living in this hostel in this bed sit um, in temporary accommodation and going downstairs to smoke with the other mums and just standing in a circle and smoking and not really saying that much to each other. And then she also talked about the ways that, um, you know, they would just kind of quite tacitly, not in a formally organized way, 
but look out for other women in the hostel by signing each other in. So say someone was just having a depressive episode, was in their room, or had to go stay with their mum. Like one of the things that the welfare state makes you uh, proclaim is that you have no support, right? That you have no other recourse. You have to have nothing. So going to stay with your mum should not be an option. But of course, um, this person, the person that Tamara was describing had two very young kids and had gone to stay with her mum for a little bit. And the other women had just kind of silently taken it on themselves to sign her in so that it appeared that she was there. And these moments occur a lot across this oral history, across these accounts. Um, and they're not, you know, they're not overtly uh, structured. You know, they're not overt examples of organizing, but they are these moments of self-organization. And there was something that I wanted to, that I found really important in that and that I wanted to point out to say there is something that you're doing that is changing the structure of this, this place you're in that is transforming it in some way. Um, and I feel that, I mean, of course there are these things that are very kind of um, individual that we do to navigate these systems, but then there are also these moments that are more collective. Um, and I think these are really important in how we survive and begin to get a glimpse of other possibilities and other formations. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. And for me, that leads, I think, really well onto the question that you that you formulated to me, which is about disability justice. And I think the broader the broader thing of ableism that you brought up when you were first talking around these kind of internalized toxic definitions and ideas of disabled folks as, as burdens, for example. So the question that we have for you is how can disability justice as a framework help us understand and resist welfare state violence? Um, I'm not going to read a long thing. I've just got some notes now. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, so I thought I'd speak a little bit about the idea of interdependence. Um, <clears throat> and the disability justice framework has 10 principles in it. Um, and that there's a lot to say about those 10 things. But I, the reason I picked interdependence was because I think that it kind of sits beneath some of the other things that are required to resist. And so I, I've asked myself here, um, you know, I've written independence as a myth. And how does that look in the welfare state? So... In the welfare state, independence equals good. And independence is constructed in a way that they have kind of decided. So, for example, if you can go out to work and earn enough money not to, not to receive anything from the state, um, that's independence, right? You're financially independent and it's good. Um, and it's the same if you don't require services, you're independent and it's good. And even within services, when you require services, um, people are often praised for being independent. And this word codependency or dependency is used when people um, appear to be using <coughs> services um, in a way that services don't want to be used. Um, and so I think, yeah, independence is a myth because we're social beings. We're all kind of, we all need social support. We need connection. Um, and actually, when we don't have that is when we see distress and, and sadness and despair. Um, actually, so it's really weird to me that the, uh, the independence is heralded in such a kind of, yeah, it's, it's really reified. Um, so disability justice calls for interdependence, which I'm, yeah, many of you probably know this, um, but I'm going to read out um, a definition. So it says, we meet each other's needs as we build towards liberation, knowing that state solutions inevitably extend to further control our lives. So it's the idea that we 
um, support each other in community um, and that we connect with others and we encourage that. We encourage leaning on each other. Um, and so, yeah, the other aspects of disability justice, like sustainability, for example, to make sure that we're sustainable in this struggle, and, and you know, like Stella says, that we, we keep going until we're carried out in a box, that's gonna need interdependence. We're gonna need to lean on each other, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I just think it's quite an important foundation. Um, and I've forgotten now my own question. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> so I'm like, have I said everything that I wanted to say? Um, I wanted to say that, um, yeah, I'm not, I guess there's, um, I think it's important to say that I believe in a public healthcare system that's free for all. Like, I, I don't, I'm, I don't want this to kind of be misinterpreted that, you know, because I think there is a tension. Like, I remember going to a meeting uh, during COVID, actually, around mutual aid. And I remember, like, lots of, like, s talking around, like, supporting each other. And um, some quite, like, specific, like, political ideas that that's, that's what we should be doing more of and we should actually go towards that and that only. Um, and I think that's quite easy to say when you're maybe not in a position whereby your impairment requires you to ask certain things of other people. So how easy would you find it to ask your neighbour to take you to the toilet? Because um, at the moment, no thanks, uh, you know? But, um, and, and so, and, and how easy would it be to kind of be with our neighbours in our most vulnerable states? Um, and so I think we need to work towards that, but I, I think it's naive to think that now in this moment that all people can access all their support in that way. Um, yeah, and yeah, that, I think that's all I'll say for now, yeah. Such an important point, thank you Timu and thank you all. I think now is perhaps a good chance for us to take a 15 minute break. Um, we've got water refreshments, there's some snacks at the back so please help yourself and um, have a look at the exhibition so we're going to have 15 minutes and I think we've got a prompt on the next slide have we for the break it doesn't matter if not but we wanted to um, Okay, maybe not that. Well, what we wanted to ask you to, um, to think about, as well as the one on the slide, if that's what you fancy, is just to think about what kinds of resistance and solidarity are possible when we talk about these connected forms of state violence, as we've been speaking about. And after our 15-minute break, we'll come back and have more of an open discussion. So if you've got questions or just comments, interventions, they're really, really welcome. So we encourage you to chat to each other about them or have a think about them on your own and then bring them into the space in 15 minutes. All right. Thank you and see you all soon.
A nice, refreshing break. So we really wanted now, so we, we all feel a bit of discomfort with this model of having people up here speaking and this like divide. So we just really wanted to open up the next half an hour for discussion with you all so that we can hear about what you're up to, about your experiences and share, um, share our learnings, I suppose. So we gave you a prompt, you may or may not have thought about it, that's fine, about um, what kinds of resistance or cross-movement solidarity, welfare, state violence opens up. So you're very welcome to ask us a bit more about that or perhaps you've got questions for our speakers, but we would love to hear from you and invite any comments or questions. Oh, there is, thank you for reminding me. So I've got a mic here that I can pass to anyone that might like to start. The prompt, I think I slightly change it every time I say it, don't I, was um, what kinds of resistance, defiance, cross-movement solidarity is opened up when we talk about welfare state violence or connected forms of state violence. But you might have other points that you would like to raise. I'm going to sit with my discomfort of silence and just invite you all to have a think. Yeah! Oh, thank you, Richard. I was thinking about what you said about sharing your personal details and your personal life with people and I think and what you were saying about absorbing that shame of like when you're on welfare and, and you're receiving benefits um, and I guess in some ways I think opening that up is quite powerful like knowing that other people around you are in that same boat like I remember being at work and feeling very much like I don't know if I'm the only person here who's like financially struggling mm -hmm. but how do you get to a place where in those kind of daily spaces in our life where you you are unsure what other people's circumstances are we are having that kind of open conversation I guess and enabling each other to share about those things and be like actually I'm really broke so I can't contribute to like the work cake for whoever or whatever it is because it feels really embarrassing um so yeah I guess I don't know if that makes sense I to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> do any of you want to respond directly or do you want me to open it? We'll collect a few comments. Okay, but great question. Let's hold that. Thank you so much. So there's someone here just at the back. Um, yeah, I just I think just responded. There's something about the way in which this whole system isolates people as well. So the fact that that can be done sort of structurally or ideologically, you know, the fact that you sort of feel shame, so it, it, it sort of becomes taboo to talk about these things. So um, thinking about sort of just creating a space where we can identify that that thing actually does deliberately separate people. Um, how we go about that, it's just more that something that came to you, uh, to me while she was saying that. Um, and also my experience, um, and a lot of my friends' experience of either trying to get the right support, whether it be through welfare or through the medical system, and I've worked in there as well. It's a really perverse sort of situation. Um, an example I was talking about with a friend at the weekend, she's been labelled treatment seeking. Treatment seeking. Now, these are services that are providing treatment. You seek, tr you go there looking for treatment. So there's like, something very strange about the language that's used, which is very descriptive, which means you're accessing stuff or you're looking for benefits or you. So I think, again, it's about having more of these conversations and thinking about the ideological sort of malaise that is in those environments that actually also capture a lot of the people working there. They don't even know that they're creating this other. Uh, it's, 
Yeah. So again, this is an idle space to start, but I can't think of anything too practical, but it just adds that contribution about those two things, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you so much. Does anyone else have anything that they would like to speak to that or, or any other points? Yeah, so we've got somebody just on the end here. Um, yeah, to your point, I was actually in a situation where um, there was like a collection for a leaving kind of thing for someone and like stuff to buy them. And at the time I was like struggling to afford to eat. And um, I mean, I don't know, like it, I guess not everyone would be comfortable with saying it, but I just said, look, I'd love to contribute to this plant pot, but I'd, I'd prefer to eat. And um, I was lucky that there was like supportive people in the organization who are like, well, obviously your well-being is more important. Um, but I don't know, just sometimes just like being frank about it can invite other people to also be frank about what they're going through. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Do you want to respond? Yeah, I was just thinking when you were talking that you're really talking about allyship, aren't you? You're talking about the importance of um, being mindful of others' situation and um, supporting them um, where you can. But in terms of your question, which was like, how do you negotiate spaces where you feel embarrassed? I think we have to overcome embarrassment and, and recognize that these circumstances are imposed on us rather than some reflection of individual fault. And, um, um, have the courage to speak out and be honest about our circumstances. And you'd probably be surprised how much empathy and support that will generate unless you're working with a bunch of, you know, <laughs> insensitive people. I'm not going to say <laughs> You know what I wanted to say. Um, but yeah, you know, allyship. And I think that's, that's a key term, isn't it, when we begin to think about uh, forms of resistance it doesn't have to be you know there's that old Jamaican saying isn't there who feels it knows it but you don't necessarily have to feel it personally to be able to empathize with someone or to, to um, you know have their back um, I yeah I really like that question I like the um, suggestion of thank you, Stella, of putting it out there. Um, I think something, I mean, it's something that I've also struggled with, just that thing of being like, I don't have it. I don't have it. Um, and, and like a lot of the, like a lot of the people I talk to, um, or many times in the conversations, we sort of band back and forth between this thing of like, I don't have it, and that's okay. And like, I don't have it, and actually that's also producing a lot of struggle in my life, which is also generating some shame in the interactions that I keep having to have, right? So one thing that is really has been really important for me is not pressuring myself to believe that I'm going to fully one day get to the other side of this, but that ha being able to have access to people who maybe last week I was talking you down after your, like, appointment, your, like, um, universal credit appointment, but this week I need you to do that for me. And, like, we're using the same language. It's all stuff that I know, but I need to hear it from someone else sometimes. And it's that thing of that you were saying to me of, like, yeah, being able to, or encouraging ourselves, getting excited about even, like, um, leaning on each other. And sometimes you need to hear the very words that you could say to yourself from someone else. And so building that network also of people, if you are working with a bunch of, <laughs> who respond in a certain way, then you know you have your peoples who are gonna talk you down or up, whatever you need in that moment, to remind you that these things are structural um, and that you are, you are in a position and we, in our dispossession or in our um, disenfranchisement or however you want to term it, there's a function to that in this structure that we're living in, right? 
And so it's really important to kind of have ways to reorient yourself to that knowledge, um, even if it isn't something that you yourself individually can hold on to all the time. Mm -hmm. It's a knowledge that can be reaffirmed. Um, I was just thinking of, sh of shame as a tool, um, and it's very useful, like the construct of independence, um, you know, to evoke shame in people for not having their basic needs met is like, when you say it like in that way, it feels quite ludicrous, right? That somebody should feel shame or feel embarrassed that they don't have enough money for their basic needs, but, um, and turning that shame on people rather than on the very structures that are supposed to mean that we, we have enough and that we're not living in poverty. It's like a kind of flip of something. And it's the same, I think you mentioned that your friend had been labeled treatment seeking. Like, th uh, and then to kind of, yeah, the connotation of that being a negative thing or, and that perhaps that would then evoke shame in someone is like ludicrous. Um, and so I think sometimes it's like seeing things for what they are as well, that like, you know, yeah, it should be the powers that be that feel shame, um, not the people that can't afford to, to eat, basically. And you're making me think that d doing this work, especially around deaths by welfare, has really made me conscious of like internalized ableism, especially around productivity. So I have got, and maybe some people can relate to this, a kind of inner critical voice, which would be like totally abusive if I used it on other people, but I use it on myself. And it's a really, it's very at its most critical about being productive. So while I will totally tell other people to rest and restore if that's what they need or adapt to their kind of how they're going with time at that moment, I don't do that for myself and can be really like quite demanding in that way on myself. And so trying to challenge some of that internalized narrative of, of productivity, which I think is so ableist and so tied to capitalism and all the things that we've talked about, is also part of the work, because I'm like, if I'm doing that to myself, I must be reproducing that in some ways with other people. So I think that is also, yeah, just to go off what you said to me, part of that work for sure. Just to open it back out, has anyone got anything that you would like to add or ask? Sorry. No. I went like that because I was like, COVID, my favourite topic. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Is it all right if I say something about COVID yeah, in relation to that? Because I think, so COVID was like, what's been referred to as like a mass disabling event, right? So all of a sudden, lots of non-disabled people um, contracted COVID and became very unwell um, and also then developed long COVID mm -hmm. and were experiencing um, symptoms um, that many disabled folk have been experiencing for a long time or, you know, and, you know, part of the push to kind of not meet the needs of, or not protect clinically vulnerable people was to kind of push this capitalist agenda, carry on, carry on. If we acknowledge that people are gonna die and if we acknowledge that that's not their fault and not, you know, that we just need to do something about this virus, then it's not gonna be business as usual. Um, and I think COVID, was just, the image in my head is like, you know when you develop a photo the old school way and it suddenly emerges? It was like all the ableism that we've been talking about for years and years and years just like popped to the surface in a very short period. And it was like, oh, eugenic health policies and that are undeniable um, and absolute disregard for the life, for disabled life, for the lives of black people, people of color. Why are black people dying at a higher rate? Let's blame it on them and tell them they've got a vitamin D deficiency when actually it's that they're in jobs that are, where they're unprotected and they're forced to go into public facing spaces with no protection. Um, you know, 60% of COVID deaths were disabled people. That's not a coincidence. Like, so I think this COVID, in terms of like, 
you know, outright ableism, but also this internalized ableism has been a really clarifying event. Um, and, I, and I say that because so many people have kind of now come into contact with what it's like to be disabled in this world or seeing how disabled people are treated. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to say about COVID. <laughs> I was talking, actually, we had a launch last week and I was talking to Paula Peters, who's the photographer um, and campaigner who's taken some of the photos that are, that are over there, um, charting disabled people's protests since, like, 2012, I think. And we were talking, and some of the photos she's taken have been around um, protest about disabled people's deaths and, and COVID. And we were talking about how COVID seemed like a like it could have been something that would have had solidarity there, like maybe not previously non-disabled people could have started to understand that disability justice is a sort of solidarity, do you know what I mean? But that, do you think that has happened? Or like it's a moment that allows us to see the way state violence connects, I suppose, but I'm not sure if that has, has quite happened in the way that I would have hoped it might. I think there were a lot of examples of people coming out of their communities and showing solidarity and support. Mm -hmm. Maybe not in all in the ways that we might have wished, but there was definitely evidence of people relating to neighbours and lonely people and elderly people in a more sympathetic way. Um, maybe I'm misremembering, but um, <laughs> I certainly recall a period of time when, when people behaved like that. Um, until they started getting really fed up with lockdown and then, of course, everything went out. But, you know, while you were talking, I was thinking of the importance of agency, just just agency, just recognising that, um, you know, the anger that we feel about and the outrage we feel when we encounter some of these violent systems and, and structures... Um, is very usefully redirected into something positive that can confront it. And what I was remembering as you were speaking was um, our response to, um, back in the 80s, to the sickle cell anemia debacle. Um, some of you may remember that, you know, people were going into hospitals and doctors literally looked at them and didn't have a clue what was going on. Um, people in severe pain with all kinds of um, issues that needed immediate attention. And in our community, um, many, many people were impacted by this because either their children had sickle cell or they themselves did. And um, when we saw that the state or the hospitals or the NHS was just failing to respond to that need, we came together and we came up with our own responses and part of that was about just informing our community, giving them the information they need, needed. Part of it was about um, self-funding, self-determination, trying to find money to support further research and part of it was just um, making sure that the information we were disseminating was getting through to doctors and nurses. So, to me, that was a, a good example of agency, and I can think of others, like the campaign against Depo-Bavera, which was another injustice, where um, black and working-class women were being given this injectable contraceptive that had all kinds of dubious side effects that were known but ignored. And, again, you know, it was a combination of people who were impacted by it, but people who felt outraged by it, coming together and finding ways to speak out, to inform people and to campaign around it. And um, I know that might sound a bit old hat these days. You know, so people sometimes say to me, well, um, what does activism look like now? And I don't really get online activism. You know, when people say I'm an activist and they just sit behind their computers typing away, that doesn't really work for me. I like what happened on Saturday when tens and tens of thousands of people stepped out into the street and said, nah, not in our name. So I think that, um, yeah, I'm rambling a bit, but I think, I think we have to hold on to that sense that we do have agency. And um, 
Um, I take your point, Emma, about interdependence, and not everybody has the same agency as others, but that there is certainly a case for um, collectivizing our shared anger when, when we think about the way the state behaves. And um, sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't, but that shouldn't stop us trying. Thank you, Stella. I think, you, do you have a question? Sorry. <laughs> um, about productivity. And yeah. Then it kind of reminded me, and we started talking about COVID, about when all the newspapers were like, everyone's quiet quitting. And it's like, no, everyone's realized they don't like their jobs and they kind of don't like their lives and they don't want to do their jobs anymore. But it is that thing of agency and of kind of going past that stage of, of sitting there and just kind of doing the bare minimum at work or whatever it is and collectivizing that. And I think that's kind of what. Thank you. Mm -hmm, yeah, here we go. So maybe you can swap. Um, I think there's something interesting happening right now in terms of like how people are collectivizing and sharing information in um, around a lot of the figures that have been published um, around black people's uh, mortality around birth. Mm -hmm. um, and bad outcomes for um, newborns and parents. Um, where like there's a lot of information being shared that is, that is changing the way that people who go into hospital to have their babies interact with the medics they meet. Um, but then there's also something interesting in thinking, in like uh, creating not new forms of care, but remembering older forms of care and bringing those into the hospital. So around doulaship and kind of thinking about the entire period of pregnancy and before pregnancy, um, and a lot of educational material that's being shared um, in that way. So it's an online and an in-person uh, um, approach in that, your doula is probably in person. Um, some of these services are voluntary um, or, you know, uh, donation-based, and then some people charge. Um, but I think this is an interesting space because it also is thinking about uh, often black people's health in a very long-term way. So we were just like spitballing and talking about like air quality and this kind of thing, thinking very holistically um, about like what. What is, what is affecting our bodies in ways that are just environmental um, and that are the result of policy, right? They don't come out of nowhere and thinking about how that creates certain outcomes. So away from this thing of individualizing, because what was it? Well, I think there was like a first, um, the first reasons that were given for why black people were kind of dying in childbirth were like very, very individualizing mm -hmm. or atomizing. I can't remember even, it was just ridiculous. Um, but gradually, or actually quite quickly I think, because it's not been that many years, like um, new understandings of that have built up and been circulated among black people, which I think is very mm. important and interesting and maybe kind of thinking about how um, yeah, people utilize their agency in these yeah. ways. Thank you, Dorika. So we're going to come to a close in a couple of minutes. Does anyone in the audience or any of our speakers want to finish on finish on something? Add anything? Ask a question that you've just thought of or that you have just plucked up the courage to ask? Yeah, Jim, okay. Um, is this working? No, it's not working. Uh, I'll just speak loudly. Um, I'm, um, I think it should be working. It is working? Oh, yeah. it is working. Yeah, I just have to hold it really close. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm a great believer in the power of complaining. I love complaining. Um, <laughs> like, no, seriously, because complaining um, has the power to be able to save your life, you know? And um, shout out baby girls or Neil Hurston, like, if 
you do not say kind of like where it hurts, what hurts you. They will kill you and say you enjoyed it. So, but I believe in complaining, not just you complaining about a specific situation, but the collective action of it as well. And especially being disabled people, oftentimes we are in situations and positions where we have to advocate for ourselves. And that can get, it can get tiring at times, depending on the situation you might be going through, you might be having a flare up, a depressive episode of what it is. Like you might not have that in you and having people around you able to advocate for you. So sometimes it might just be somebody there with you at the GP appointment. So the GP knows, hey, I'm watching you. Like everything that you're doing, I can see what's going on. And um, yeah, complain, complain often, complain loudly complain to who will listen, complain to those that won't listen, because at some point you're going to get through, but um, yeah, never, like don't allow people to just say like, oh, you're whinging, you keep going on about the same thing or whatever, just, yeah, keep complaining, like, and yeah, no, I love complaining, like it's so good, like even if I'm gonna do it and I'll figure it out, I, I love complaining, like this is bullshit, I'm gonna sit in it, I'm gonna marinate in it, but yeah, like, yeah, so, complain. I think that's a great way to end, right? <laughs> I, I love that, thank you so much. And I think that's a wonderful way to, to bring to a close this gathering, and just thank you so much to all of you and the folks online for being here and can take away a real message of the very different ways that resistance can look, right? And also that so much of this can be new but may also be very old and knowing those histories of resistance and those, those ways of that defiance, I guess, and, it's, and, and how far that goes back is so important in terms of what we're doing. Um, and the connections uh, across those different forms of state violence came out really strongly. So thank you. It was everything that I dreamed it would be hearing you in conversation with each other. So deep, deep gratitude and, and love. And thank you for all being here. Um, I just wanted to remind you that on the Healing Justice website, there are loads of resources if you might need them after this session. Um, and there are also tons of um, videos of other events and sessions that we've had. For example, we did a session on um, disability justice and somatics, which, which might be useful, might be interesting to folks. And we've also got some sessions coming up um, as part of our festival that might be, well, that's certainly relevant to these conversations and that you might want to join. So there's just three I wanted to share. One of those is with Triple Cripple. So it was, it was great that we finished on Jamoke talking about complaint. Um, and that's a session on blackness, disability and culture. And it's on October 19th from 7 to 9 and that's online. The next day, on Friday the 20th, we've got film screenings of Dolly Sen's film about the violence of the Department for Work and Pensions. And there's some of her pieces um, from the protest that the film is about just, just in here in this space with us. And also a screening of parts of the um, a film by the brilliant disability justice collective Sins Invalid. And then on November 5th, and I think perhaps the most relevant to what we've been talking about here um, at Block 336, from 11 till 1 in the morning, afternoon, um, will be a discussion with families who have been bereaved from different forms of state violence, so welfare system, mental health system, policing, um, and the kinds of solidarity forged um, in those experiences that so do come and come and join us for any of those if you can and thank you so much for rehearsing freedoms with us and for being here tonight <laughs> <laughs>